The following interview was conducted with Charles A. Trichler, Professor Emeritus of Management for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, June 23, 2010 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Good afternoon, Professor Trichler. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, tell us a little about where you were born and early years and your parents, sure. siblings. I was born in uh, Chicago, Illinois. I mainly went to school in Evanston, Illinois, a northern suburb of Chicago, and graduated from Evanston High School in 1947. Um, my uh, main activities there were the YMCA and uh, the um, study. And uh, I got a scholarship to Amherst College I went to and enjoyed thoroughly. Uh, you're asking what the major event of my life was. This was certainly going to Amherst College. And, I imagine uh, you went by train in those days, huh? Or drove. Oh, drove. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Both. Okay. Uh, and uh, but there were four of us went from Evanston High School to Amherst. The previous year there was eight. The next year, six. It, it was a major, major kind of feeder school to, to Amherst, uh, and uh, in those days, uh, it wasn't uh, the usual thing to attend Northwestern. You went away to school uh, if you could, and um, so uh, I was a fair student. I was uh, elected to Phi Beta Kappa and that sort of thing. And uh, then I went into the military, was in the Army, and uh, went to Germany, was in the Quartermaster Corps, which was the first taste of what I eventually went into in business. But when I came out of the Army, they didn't have a placement bureau or anything. So <coughs> I went to Yale, which I'd been accepted to as a graduate student in English, the PhD program. But that really didn't, uh, wasn't the same as reading Catcher in the Rye as an undergraduate. I had to do Beowulf and Old English, Anglo-Saxon, <laughs> and, and take exams in Latin and German and French. And so it, it, it really didn't uh, fit uh, for me. And so I got an MBA at Northwestern and worked for a while and then uh, taught at Northwestern at night, and I liked that. So I uh, switched to getting a PhD at at um, Stanford, and then I came to Purdue, and I I've been at Purdue since then. Of course, I've gone on sabbaticals, visiting positions, uh, largely in Europe, and so on. And uh, I retired in 1999 when I was 70, and I've been very active with, uh, I find myself very active in retirement, and I get the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal every day, and uh, hardly have time to read it. The, uh, you'd earlier looked at some of the activities. Uh, yes. I'm treasurer, I've been treasurer of uh, lots of things because uh, I majored in, uh, in accounting within the business area at Stanford and uh, taught accounting at uh, Purdue. Did you want to ask me a question? I was going to uh, elaborate a little bit about Purdue and about some of the faculty advising and, and also when you were the uh, director of the Cranert Master's Program, some of your experiences at Purdue in the Cranert School. Well, that is interesting. Uh, could I sort of go chronologically? Sure. That would be helpful. So, uh, I wasn't young when I arrived here uh, and because then I was married and Did you have children? had three children. Okay. And um, what was the campus like, though, when you came? You came in the 60s, correct? Late 67, 60s? yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Well, uh, it was kind of uh, transformative at Brannert. Uh, M. Weiler was the dean who just started up the school and mm -hmm. just got the money from Craner to fund it. And uh, the Craner faculty were all kind of new to Purdue. And it was very much oriented to economics. 
and it was, it was not that much of a business school, although <coughs> while M. Weiler started up the master's program, which was uh, sort of modeled on the MBA at Harvard. And, uh, but uh, the Cranor School was something sort of apart because, like, there was a whole bunch of us from Stanford, for example. Oh, so some others came with you from Stanford at the same time? Either before or after. Oh, okay. There was, there were uh, one that came with me at the same time. But there were a couple from previous years and a couple afterwards okay. who came from Stanford. But most faculty came from Harvard. But John C. was the originator of the master's program in business. And John Day was associate dean and then dean. Both of them were, were doctoral uh, degrees from, from Harvard. And there were a lot of Harvard uh, uh, PhDs more than Stanford. And then along came uh, the great turn left in the United States uh, with the civil rights controversy in the Vietnam War and uh, all the assassinations of uh, uh, John Kennedy and uh, Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King. And uh, so the Cranor School was relatively liberal, but it was new to Purdue and the rest of, the rest of Purdue was fairly conservative, especially the agriculture school. And, uh, of course, uh, there was a uh, whole change at Purdue that I wouldn't know as much about it uh, after World War II with all the GIs coming back mm -hmm. and the GI Bill and all. But uh, we live on the property of, of Dean Reed. The, uh, he might not have been the founding dean of of agriculture, but the same the figure. Yes. Oh, interesting. Okay. And uh, there's there's a sort of vintage racial covenant on the property that though all those things existed in those in days. In those days, uh huh. And uh, there was. Excuse some me. Was the Craner building built when you came, though? I mean, it, it yes, was. Yes. Okay. It had just been built. Okay. Okay. Just been finished. Okay. And, Excuse uh, me. <coughs> So then uh, along came um, the civil rights movement. And of course, uh, Lafayette and Purdue had been segregated. And uh, uh, there were big signs found about from the John Birch Society and so on, hmm. opposing the UN opposing civil rights, opposing Martin Luther King, they're like billboards. And uh, uh, by the time I arrived, blacks were, were in the classrooms and in the dormitories, which wasn't the case before. And um, the, the big development uh, the first years was women. Now there were women in home economics and so on, but there, there weren't women like in the Cranor School. The Cranor School was built without uh, restrooms for lady students. Hmm. And the, there were a few uh, female students and uh, they of course went up to the higher floors to the secretary uh, restrooms. <laughs> and um, uh, my wife got an MBA from uh, Michigan, and uh, she went through the same transition, but Michigan had many more uh, lady uh, MBAs and PhDs than Purdue did. And uh, my wife went from an MBA at Michigan to work for IBM, but when she came here, she just raised the children until they'd gotten into high school and then she taught school. Mm -hmm. 
uh, <clears throat> and um, we we came to uh, to Lafayette uh, as Episcopalians. We actually had one of those letters of transmittal like they had, and um, we discovered that the St. John's and Good Shepherd were battling over the resident uh, Episcopalians. And the St. John's minister came to our house uh, a week or two after we'd arrived and uh, told us in no uncertain terms that we should come to St. John's. And, uh, but we went to Good Shepherd instead. And uh, it, it has been a dicey operation all along, Good Shepherd, and we still go there now. And uh, that was the first of my many treasury volunteer operations at uh, Good Shepherd. And Good Shepherd uh, housed to the SAS, the Students for uh, SDS, Students for Democratic. Uh, yeah, SDS, yeah. What is that, right? How do you say that? I forget. I, one of the things about being 81 is that you forget so many things. It is, it is hard to remember. But going back so far, I can sort of fill it all in. Mm -hmm. So then the... Excuse me, the house that you live in now, is that the one you bought when you came? No. Oh, we okay. Li we, oh. we lived in uh, a, the, the, the uh, Rene Maness, another faculty member's house that was going to Stanford as a sabbatical. So we just oh, okay. moved into their house. And then we moved across the street on Indian Trail. And... Um, and we moved down on Meridian. Mm -hmm. So um, the next uh, development after uh, civil rights was uh, the Vietnam War. And that was sort of the, the heyday of um, the growth of the Craner business program because uh, Students had to stay in school to keep out of the service, or if they'd been in the service, they came back and uh, wanted a degree. And we, we were originally uh, a <coughs> training ground for business, for engineers, or science students. And that's mostly what we had. And uh, I think there was one woman in the first class in 67, 68, and a scattering. But uh, after the Vietnam War, there were, there were many women. Um, at any rate, uh, can I tell you a little bit about the Vietnam period? Sure. Uh, so there was great opposition to the war on campuses, less so at Purdue than practically any Big Ten school. But there was, there was a sit-in. Do you remember that? Yes. You do remember? Oh, yes. Sit-in in the Union? Yeah. So I'm not making things up? Oh, no. Many others have alluded to who were here during that time. They often refer to it as the unrest, time <laughs> unrest, student <laughs> unrest or whatever. They have different classifications for it, yes. So I'm glad that other people have talked about this and verified it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I had... Um, a student in class, uh, an undergraduate, who was on the football team and who was the leader of the opposition to the peaceniks in the Union. Mm -hmm. He was uh, the leader of the group that threw them out of the Union. It, it was sort of a, a violent kind of confrontation. And uh, he didn't... Uh, he didn't come to class, and uh, he was married. And I talked to his wife about his not coming to class. But you couldn't exactly object to that because uh, the, the left-wing students were also, as well as the right-wing, both groups were boycotting classes. Have you heard about that? Dad, classes no. not being attended? No. And. Um, so um, 
the, the, there was a whole question of what faculty should do. And so um, the... Uh, they just didn't come at all? Yeah. Oh. Not just one or in two the, times? In, in, that, that was in the, the spring. That was the year that there was the Kent State affair. Uh -huh. And um, the, the shooting at Kent State. And after that, the, um, the, there was kind of a boycott of going to Kletz. And uh, so what we ended up doing was just passing both groups, the left-wingers and the right-wingers. And um, however many of the, uh, the left-wing students were better students than the right-wing students, so I say so. The, the, the right, right-wing group was well represented on the athletic teams and so on, and the fraternities and sororities. So, uh, the, uh, we, we had some of our students in jail, and uh, we ran bail for them to get them out. Those were mostly the sit-in types, and so that was uh, a great transformation at uh, Purdue. But the same thing was going on at the West Lafayette High School. And uh, there, uh, one of the Korean students, the valedictorian, gave the famous speech at, uh, at West Lafayette High School, uh, ridiculing the Golden Ghetto uh, and that uh, it was not a commencement, but just a continuation of the same thing. And the, um, so there, there, was, there was a similar kind of hmm. division at the high school, and, and uh, a, a good many of the left-wing students refused to attend the, the commencement uh, at the high school. And, um, so it was a, a time of tremendous transformation. Purdue became sort of like Wisconsin and Michigan and so on. But as you said, uh, it, was, it, <laughs> it was described as unrest Just rather unrest. than rebellion. <laughs> well, some people probably have different terminology in how they express it, you know. Yes. Right. Yeah. Did you have a question? Uh, I was going to ask, continue on with after that, then what was the next? And also, you want to, I would like you to address some of the research that, that you've been involved with. Up uh -huh. Well, uh, I was more of a teacher than a researcher. Okay. And I, I, I will get to that okay. uh, in just a second. So, you asked earlier about uh, uh, off camera, so to speak. Sure. About being director of the master's program. So, I became director of the master's program. And um, that uh, was very demanding. There, were, there weren't administrators then. And you were it. I, yeah, pretty much. And there was a graduate student that helped me. And um, then I just continued teaching a full load while I was director of the master's program. <laughs> now the director of the master's program is a full-time administrative job. <laughs> right. um, and, uh, the Did the master's the program, was it increasing over time, too, while you were there in charge? Well, it, it was very strong and high quality because of this business of the students wanting to avoid going in the military okay. or they were coming back from the military. And the students coming back from the military were very motivated and uh, uh, most of them had had the uh, engineering or scientific kind of exposure in the military in addition to their undergraduate degrees. So it was uh, an excellent program and even uh, the Coast Guard and the Air Force sent officers to come here as did uh, General Motors Institute which is now Kettering University Right. Uh, and they paid for uh, their graduates to come to Brannard to get business degrees 
And one of the things they liked was it was a one-year program. Well, I was um, the director of until they switched to a two-year program. And uh, it didn't uh, really mesh very well for me because, like, uh, the dean brought in Governor Rhodes from Ohio who had ordered the National Guard into Kent State as the speaker at our main uh, event, uh, sort of the, the graduation or, dinner. Okay. It, it wasn't a commencement. But a graduation, a yeah, completion of the program. Well, it was short of, okay. it was before the completion of the program, uh, because they didn't want to interfere with the university level commencement. And so that uh, was pretty troublesome. Uh, and th there was kind of this left-right division running through the university. And, uh, we, now that sort of thing is really passe, but it wasn't then. And so we went off to uh, to Belgium for a couple of years, and I, I taught an executive MBA for Boston University in Brussels, and the children went to to Belgian schools. And uh, that was a good experience for you. Well, it was, but it kind of breaks up your sure. integration to Purdue. Mm -hmm. And it was for two years, mm -hmm. because we didn't want to go over there and just come back in a semester right. and yeah. if, we, if the children were going to go. Right. And they really, really enjoyed the schools there. Um, and our son got very involved with soccer, which he continued. And there was a curious thing, you know, even now with the World Cup, sure. you read about it in the paper, Purdue does not have a men's soccer team. And that that's kind of an extrapolation of the culture that I'm talking about that you encountered, you know, coming from mm -hmm. Ivy League schools like I did, going to, uh, as I said, Amherst out of uh, high school in Yale and then uh, Northwestern and Stanford were all private schools. Right, yeah. And um, the uh, or, uh, soccer was, was the standard sport sure. at those schools. Um, Another one was archery, they'd have that too, you know. Well, that, uh, why did you bring that up? I, I, I wouldn't think of archery as being a World Cup kind of Not a World Cup, but it's a, like an intramural, but many of those schools would have ha had, had it. We had it at school when I went to college. Well, I think, yeah, the, and, and of course, we lived through when the, the great thing uh, after the, the Vietnam War was women coming in. And so... Uh, Women's that, athletics. That, that women, well, and in the classroom. Right, I'm at sure. At the Craner School. Mm -hmm. And in engineering, a lot of women. And they were good students, and then, then the wave after that was the foreign students coming in. After the women had pretty much settled in and integrated, then was the great influx of of foreign students, and and there were a lot of them in the Cranor School, and it was sought after and recognized because of its national rating, and uh, it wasn't just. Um, Taiwan and India and China wasn't in the first wave because it was still communist. And, but there were a lot of students from Japanese students and Malaysian students. And we, we had a strong program there. Mm -hmm. uh, you were asking about research earlier. Uh -huh. And uh, my research, to begin with, uh, my dissertation out of Stanford won the prize in the, for the academic association, but it was about inflation. And inflation was very hot, but and inflation dwindled to nothing, so I, I switched over to uh, international, because I'd been uh, teaching in Belgium, and I later went to taught at uh, 
in vain. That's the way you say it in English. And in, in Flemish, it's Leuven. And, uh, uh, the, uh, and I taught in the Flemish division in Leuven. And I taught at the uh, University of Helsinki one summer in Finland. These are all countries where English is the main academic language because uh, their own language is not uh, uh, widely used. Uh, so uh, Finnish is impossible to, to read or speak. And I would the, think so. I the, 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 <laughs> the Flemish is a little better because it's the sort of uh, uh, dialect of Dutch. And, uh, but I, I was in Bel taught in Belgium twice, Louisville twice. And uh, so I went into uh, international research and then uh, at the, in my closing days I got very interested in, in derivatives. So I was ahead of my time uh, in terms of that subject. And to begin with, uh, it was derivatives involving foreign exchange. Um, uh, futures uh, uh, whereby you could bet on which direction foreign currency rates were going to go. And uh, of course that passed on to interest rates and uh, uh, after my time uh, credit default swaps and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the um, Another big change over that period was the use of the computer. And uh, I invested a lot uh, in that. And uh, it wasn't just uh, using PowerPoint, but actually doing the accounting on the computer and displaying it in front of the room. And uh, that was a big emphasis in terms of the last uh, 15 or 20 years of my career. Should we, should we close with that? Did well, I want a couple, I'd like to ask you a couple things. Uh, talk about family. Did, you, did your children go to Purdue? Uh, well, of course, they attended classes at Purdue, okay. but none of them went to Purdue. Okay, okay. And uh, do you have, um, that um, the awards and honors I want to talk First of all, you got that one from the Accounting Association for that manuscript contest. That was very nice. And then the um, the Noren Outstanding Teacher Award yes. at the Craner and the Honeywell. Thank you for bringing these up. And the Honeywell Master Teaching Award. Yes, thank you. Does it, were any of them were surprised? Sometimes I ask people that. Or did you sort of know that you might be getting it? Sometimes oh. people are surprised. Some are, sometimes they're not, they have a clue. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I didn't get them multiple times, so yes, they were surprises. That's nice. Uh, the, um, yeah, I uh, also uh, entered in actively to uh, the Amherst College uh, alumni activities. Night became vice president of the uh, class in uh, class of 51 at Amherst and also I um, have been maintaining their web page and the web page uh, keeps track of, of students that we funded with uh, honors or scholarships uh, uh, the various activities of the uh, classmates and uh, Unfortunately, obituaries. Very nice. That's good. Uh, the community, you're active in the local community. Uh, I try to. Uh, I've been uh, uh, treasurer of a number of organizations, which fits mm -hmm. in with my being a CPA and a, and a accounting professor. Uh, so um, I've. Um, as I said, the first was at the church, Good Shepherd, and then uh, Phi Beta Kappa, and um, the ACLU, 
the Lafayette, Lafayette Adult Resource Academy on the boards of these and uh, the Aquinas Educational Foundation of St. Tom's and uh, that uh, is uh, a special honor because I'm uh, not actually Catholic um, but I've been very involved with uh, religion I think and interested uh, in the uh, Catholic Church and during the Vatican two days we were very involved with uh, St. Thomas and uh, the priests there showed great leadership especially during like the Vietnam War period able to maintain a middle ground mm -hmm. um, Father Haggerty and Father Pickett and uh, that's continued on of course the Dominicans are are there are, now? Are there now? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they provide great leadership. And uh, the Dominicans also were uh, uh, in charge of the Catholic program at Stanford when we were there. Right. And uh, it, um, although we we went to the Episcopal Church, we were involved with the with the Catholic student activities there as well. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. What about, uh, do you have a Purdue tradition that you like, uh, any tradition of Purdue that you'd like to share with us or an outstanding event? Well, actually, um, we don't buy tickets to the football and basketball games. Mm -hmm. We uh, have often gone uh, sure. with friends or when people come from out of town, we try to get some tickets if they want to go. So it isn't like we never go. We got nothing against it, but it, <laughs> it, it really isn't uh, something. We're not that season ticket holders, in other words. <laughs> but you can uh, get but, tickets. But I think the greatest tradition is trying to meet up with alumni when we come back. Yeah. And um, the um, uh, our uh, our son, I said, played soccer, and they went to the state finals. And, uh, and then he was quarterback of an undefeated team, so we, we went to most of his games, beginning with Little League and on through the, the next uh, eight years. So we saw eight years of football. Maybe that was the reason we didn't, didn't thought that going to football on Saturday after a Friday night game was more than we could handle. Um, the, um, it is quite a bit. <laughs> well, it is, yeah. and uh, we didn't go to all the away games, but we went to a lot of football games, and because uh, he was quarterback, it was, it was, it was uh, we were always worried about whether he'd get hurt and, sure. and how well the team would do and so on, and they did do fairly well. Right. Um, and this year they did extremely well. That well, excited. that's true. And uh, the, uh, the the boys this year were far better students than than the students the year that that uh, they went undefeated. They were they were defeated in the state. Uh, you know, it's it's up or out in the state yeah, tournament. Yeah, I understand. Um, the um, but uh, I spoke earlier about uh, soccer not being a Purdue tradition, and uh, the, the the soccer team went to the state finals, and they they should have won actually, but I think they're worn out because they played football Friday night and sat and Saturday they played mm -hmm. soccer. Uh, that isn't allowed anymore. But the uh, uh, the high school vigorously opposed having a soccer team because it drew from the other sports and uh, they, they barely had enough boys to go around with, without having a soccer team and uh, David was the same year as uh, Jonathan Briggs who became the kicker for Purdue 
and until recently had held all the records. And uh, his father had been a professional soccer player and he coached the team. And uh, it, was, uh, it was really a big deal. But if you look, you were talking about yearbooks. Of course, yearbooks were a big deal and, and the soccer team wasn't even mentioned in the, in the yearbook and, and hardly in the newspaper. Uh, occasionally there'd be some little article, but now there's you know, big articles about the boy and girl soccer right, teams. Yeah. Right. Did you have another question? Um, I'm coming down to the wire, but you want two things. In closing comments, anything you'd like to say that I forgot to ask, and anything else, you've covered your retirement activities, I was going to ask, so you keep, and you do some traveling. Well, we have traveled a lot. Right. Uh, I don't know, I guess we're up to 60 countries we've been in, and we, we've, uh, in addition to Belgium and Finland, where we, where we worked, of course I was in the Army in Germany as a boy, and then uh, uh, we lived a semester in Buenos Aires, and um, we share with you an interest in the Mayan culture in uh, both Guatemala and Mexico, mm -hmm. and uh, we've uh, spent time in places like Guatemala, and uh, we've been to Egypt and Israel. And and all through Europe, of course, in the times that we were in Europe, we would travel, Take travel, away travel there, sure. just, and that, that's a nice part of traveling when you're living there and working there because you can just go for a long weekend, and especially with kids, you're there. It's not really suited to doing touring, and the, it all blurs together. The, you can hardly tell one church or museum from the next. So you have to go in small doses. Sure. Exactly. Um, I think I'll leave it up to you. Anything that I forgot to ask? or I don't it? think so. You think so? You so think more, than, more than enough. Oh, very yeah, I, it's a great honor to have been included uh, with your My oral pleasure. history. And I, I don't know, are there other universities that have this? Well, I think there are quite a few. A lot of museums, a lot of people have it. But I think Purdue, I don't believe the regional campuses are doing it because I've interviewed a couple of people at... How about, a, how about Indiana University? Uh, yes, they have a program. They do? Yeah, okay. they do, right. As far as I know. Thank you, Dr. Trister. Appreciate that. This concludes.